So Bob, anonymous annual patron from Arizona, emailed in and said, do therapists ever talk about their clients to people in their personal lives in a way that preserves their client's confidentiality? And is it considered okay to do that? I can't imagine what it would be like to have an extremely intense session that rattles you to the core, and then when you return home, not be able to explain even in the slightest what has had you rattled. Outside of talking about things in supervision, how else do you find support as a therapist? Bob, what do you think? I talk about my experience of my clients, but I don't talk about my clients. Like, what does that mean? It means if I had an intense session that maybe it went really well, I definitely want to take a victory lap with Colleen. So, and what, what would that sound like? So it might sound like, so this thing happened and I had this killer validation. It went something like this, blah, blah, blah. And yay me. Right. Yeah. What if you got rattled? Would you say something along oh, those Oh, yeah, for sure. What would that sound like? It sounded like, I, this one really shook me up. I'm really upset. I'm still feeling it right now. Really rough session. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's one way to get support. Yeah. Um, and I do that as well. And what I'll also say is that I do sometimes... So the ethics around confidentiality and around this sort of thing is kind of clear and also kind of unclear. Mm. In some ways, and I remember studying this a lot um, in various different courses, and one of the, the easiest way, of course, is to say as a therapist, there's never a scenario where you can even disclose that, you know, that sure. because the har- there can still be harm to a client because say you get out of session and you tell Colleen, oh, really rough session. That was hard. I got real rattled. I'm feeling like a bad therapist today. I feel like they were judging me and, and attacking me unfairly. And Colleen has no confidential ethical code. So she could tell a friend or she could post on Facebook. She wouldn't. But she could. She could. And just us saying, well, my wife won't do that isn't sufficient. Like, you, you mm-hmm. can't. You, it, 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 so she could go online and say, my husband had a horrible session, said that the last client that he had at 5 o'clock was a real jerk face. The client finds out about this and is harmed by it. It harms treatment. That's unethical. Yeah, right. So uh, there's really under... Uh, no circumstance, uh, a scenario where it's actually ethically approved of. And what they'll say is, well, you need to have your supervisor or colleagues who you have peers, you know, because if you told me, if you called me, I do have confidential ethical training and integrity. And so if you told me I had a rough session and you could actually tell me all sorts of details about your clients because we have a professional collegial consultation relationship like that yeah. and that is considered to be within the ethical codes that um, that scenario th- th- so what to say is don't tell your wife tell a colleague or mm-hmm. tell a supervisor and so in some ways it's very clear and it's pretty cut and dry pretty easy to describe pretty easy to well but hard to follow because if you're rattled and you don't want to call me every day <laughs> and I'm not available or other people aren't and you just want to come out of your office and you know say something to your wife then it makes sense that you would so here comes the gray zone in ethical codes which is that what's the likelihood what's the pros versus the you know versus the con and would you be successfully sanctioned by your licensing board or sued in a civil court if say you did say something like that to Colleen. So say say you went uh, to Colleen and you said that. You're just like, oh, really rattling session. My client was attacking me, being unfair. Um, I Yeah, really. I don't even know if I want to work with that person anymore. You know, whatever it is you say. And you uh, and she in within reason 
is talking to a coworker the next day and says, oh, how are things going at home? Oh, good. You know, how's, how's Bob doing? Oh, he's good. How's his work going? Oh, good. Uh, does he ever have, like, hard times? Well, yeah, he had a pretty hard session uh, yesterday. He, he actually, you know, told me about it. And then that coworker of Colleen's like, huh, anyway, goes home and says, uh, you know, something interesting. Colleen said that her husband had this hard session yesterday. And that got me thinking, like, I know that so-and-so goes to Bob, you know, our other, my friend, who Colleen doesn't even know I know, but I know that my friend actually sees Bob. In fact, I recommended that the... Um, they go to dinner that night. And they're like, hey, you know, I heard an insane thing. Bob said that the other day they had a really hard session. Um, and uh, uh, I was just wondering, like, are you giving Bob a hard time? Like, you know, or just something, you know. Something. Yeah. So this is all reasonable. Yeah, it could happen. Seattle's a small town. Yeah, it is. And you could imagine that Colleen might say something like that, you know, or yeah. a, or a, a spouse of a therapist sure. might say something yes. like that. right. And or... Another uh, thing that happen, could happen is that a client is listening to this podcast and learns, wait, so you kind of talk about me? Has he said anything to Colleen? Because I don't want him to say anything to Colleen. I don't want him to say anything about me ever, 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 ever. Most, I don't know many clients that would be that way, but anyway. So the harm could happen that way. And what's the likelihood, one, that that would happen, two, What's the likelihood that harm would actually befall the client? Or would the client say like, well, I know I'm not that client because I, I have a pretty, we don't fight for it. Or actually, yeah, that, I, think, I think Bob was talking about me in that session, but we'll talk about it next time. Did you, did you tell Colleen you had a hard session? You'd be like, oh, well, I didn't say your name, but yeah, I might've said something like I had a hard session. Did, did my wife tell your coworker <laughs> Or your friend, her coworker, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, um, uh, uh, one, this is what I told my wife. By the way, it and it, I didn't say her name, and and I wasn't like, I'll tell you what was in my heart, which was like, I care about you, and it was hard. Our last session was hard. It was hard for me, you know. And we talked about that. You know, can you uh, just deal with it? and have it not harm a client. Yes, that's also true, you know? So, and on the scale of things, is that the same as like having sex with a client? No, right? It's it's not, <laughs> you know, the, the chance of harm happening by telling your wife you had a hard session, the harm potential there is uh, not as high and not likely to happen anyway, right? So all that has to be, because on the pro side of doing it is, Therapists need someone to vent to. <laughs> they need some way of coping. And if it's unreasonably and inconvenient to call a colleague every day, then they might benefit, the clients might benefit if the therapist is allowed to say something to their spouse as soon as they get out of session, right? So uh, the other thing is, is that if this did come around and you did get, say, that scenario, the client does make a licensing board report and you end up in front of the licensing board, what's the chance that they're going to do something to you? Um, I would say extremely slim. They would probably at the most say, you have to take an eight-hour ethics course on confidentiality. So, and that wouldn't be that horrible, right? Um, so there's that. Um, all these things have to be taken into consideration before taking... The, the other thing, <laughs> the third thing I'll say, is that even if you did have a scenario like that happen with the coworker and the da-da-da, and it is found that you made a mistake, but you demonstrated to, uh, you have documented um, discussions of like the pros and the cons of this kind of thing. What could you say to your wife that would not break confidentiality? Um, what could you even say to your wife of like, so by the way, you can't tell anyone even that I said this to you because that will that there's a chance that that could lead to harm. So um, never repeat to other people that I told you I just got out of a difficult session, you know. So if you thought about it and you went through all the considerations and you had kind of a policy, even though it was fudging it a little bit, in all likelihood, according to my experience in courts and in licensing boards, you'd be, you'd be okay. 
not as if like, ha ha ha, I don't care about clients' confidentiality because mm. we do, we, yeah. deep, we deeply care. Absolutely. But we have to, you know, we've been therapists for 25 years. Like we can't ever say anything to our wives about <laughs> what, you know, it's rare that I'll say anything to my wife, but occasionally it's just like, oof, or hey, I feel like a good therapist today. Um, you can't say you can't even refer to it's like you work for the CIA or something like it's that it's not it's not like that you know in terms of the ground level reality of how these things play out so that's what I'll say about that Mom. right on um, now I will also say that there is a line and I do know therapists have full conversations with their friends and family about their clients you know just identifying all sorts of things my my client is a, a politician a local politician da, 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 da. or my client is a famous person or my client um works is the owner of the mcdonald's down the street you know i know therapists will do shit like mm. that or a more way more common thing is people will post online and people are starting to wake up to the reality of the uneth the ethical codes about this is that they will say things like I have a client who suffers from this and this and this, and I'm looking for a referral. So on one hand, you're like, okay, well, that's how a lot of people are getting referrals these days, right? But you have just announced to the internet that you have a client with the following issues. <laughs> and if you have, you know, 20 clients, it narrows it down quite a bit. And so that's a massive violation of privacy. So... You know, imagine you go to a doctor, a medical doctor, and you're one of 15 patients that the doctor has, and they get on and say, like, oh, I, have a, I have a patient who has, you know, a venereal disease, and d d d d It's just like, uh, well, you know, I'm one of 15 people, especially if you identify, and, you know, he's a male in, in his 50s or whatever. Like, people are doing that a lot, and mm -hmm. that's not okay. Yeah. Now the chance of harm happening isn't very high, but it you know it's it's the internet. You're yeah. announcing it to seven and a half billion humans. Yeah. <laughs> that it, it significantly increases your risk, right? If you're having a private conversation, especially with a colleague, you'd you could absolutely say something like sure. that because the chances are are not likely to harm uh -huh. the client. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of client, a lot of therapists who are extremely bad about following the confidentiality ethics and uh, around privacy and stuff. I mean, have you ever seen that happen with colleagues or associates? Yeah, not my favorite. Can you think of a scenario? Because I'm having a hard time remembering a scenario where that happened. I cannot think of a scenario off the but top But you remember of thinking like, oof, did you just announce that yeah. you have, like you just broke confidentiality yeah, right there. That's a lot of detail right there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm on a listserv uh, of a um, couple therapists and occasionally somebody will describe something they're seeing because they're looking for help or, you know, sometimes they're looking for a referral. But most of the time, they're looking for guidance and advice from the you know larger community, and there's a often a response. We have to be mindful about what we say in the listserv because of privacy needs and rules. Um, I don't think that's that hard because if you think about it, you're not actually asking about the person; you're asking about your own clinical need whatever your question is whatever is happening for you you can talk about that without revealing any client data mm -hmm. and um probably that's where you're going to get the bulk of your support anyway so the chances of somebody right, meaning that you would say hypothetically if i had a client you know or how do i approach someone who has this issue and hates me you know like yeah. it's just a general question right yeah. that's yeah right exactly right and that's the recommendation if you're going online. You have to be careful, though, because sometimes I find it's like, oh, clearly you have a client with this issue and you're just wording it as a hypothetical. Well, yeah. <laughs> Hypothetically, if I had a client with yeah. these very specific markers, you know, it's like, no. Um, so, uh, yeah. Now, uh, 
for those who are listening to the podcast, uh, which of course you are right now, <laughs> uh, I have from the beginning known about the, all the ethical considerations and the expert consensus because way back when, when I became a professor, I found myself talking about my clients at times. And so years before I was a podcaster, I locked down the practice, which is either to uh, obscure the client so much that the client wouldn't even un wouldn't even recognize themselves. You know, you change the details so much that they're they hear you talk about it and, and they're like, well, that kind of sounds like me, but not yeah. really. Yeah. Or you just come up with a fictionalized account. Right. Or you meld a bunch of people together. Right. Or you literally just get permission from the client. Right. And say, is it okay if I talk about this in this way on the podcast? Which I've done all of those. And never have I just... So if I've ever talked about a client and I didn't say this is a fictionalized account, um, I either had permission from the client or I obscured the details so severely that they either wouldn't recognize themselves or they would be like, well, that could be me, but it's so general. It could it could have been someone else, you know, because that's usually the kind of examples I'll give. It's just like I had a client once who had borderline personality disorder and here's what happened. It's just like I would imagine most clients who had borderline would say like, well, he specializes in that. So who knows if that was me or someone else? Um. Yeah. Anonymous upper tier patron says, would you be willing to share your schema therapy notes and questionnaire? Uh, yeah. So I get this question every now and then and I get it. And I, I would probably ask this too, if I were in your position, but um, one to share my notes is extremely vulnerable and I, I'm just never, ever going to do that. <laughs> so, um, so, for schema therapy or anything else because occasionally people will be like you know you're talking about your notes could you just like post those online or email me your notes i'm like nope <laughs> that's and i don't know what it is about it because like, sometimes i'll look at my notes and I'll be like, there's nothing in here that's harmful to me or anything and I'm, sometimes i'm literally just reading from my notes you know and so what but when i'm making my own personal notes and i, I was true about this as a teacher as well that like they it feels like a diary and I don't want people to see my notes. You know, I want to feel free to be able to write my notes that are just for me. I don't want to be writing my notes thinking other people are going to look at it. The other thing is, is you know, they're often pretty discombobulated. The other thing is, is sometimes I do have notes to me. I'd be like, oh, that, that sounds like me. And I, I don't say that out loud. You know what I mean? In the pocket. The other thing is this, the, sch the schema therapy questionnaire that I have been developing I would love to share it, but it's actually kind of a problem because as an academic, I consider publishing to be a very um, buttoned up affair. And if I were to publish this and share it with the, with the, uh, you know, with people, with the public, I would have to do all the diligence around academic acknowledgement and uh, making it understandable, also telling people that they probably shouldn't use this unless they're with a therapist. You know, like there's all these things. I'm not just some Yahoo on the internet that's publishing a thing. Like I, there are ethical and um, cur you know, collegial courtesy considerations that would make it one a lot more laborious for me to actually produce, and two questionable whether or not it's actually advisable. Because the questionnaire is could be confused for an actual, uh, you know, research-based measure of a psychological phenomenon of which I don't have the time to do the research around. And so it's just me coming up with a thing. And so there's um, – and it's funny. It's weird because as a podcaster, I can yammer all day long verbally. But when it comes to putting something in – in print it suddenly changes the whole game you know which is kind of a weird thing if you think about it I, i'm guessing that'll change over time in 50 years i'm guessing that there will be ethical codes and precedent around podcasters clinicians providing citations and making sure that they say certain caveats because right now 
podcasting and YouTube, it, it's completely ignored by the clinical community and the academic community. Um, but I, but it's just another mode of publication. But I find that it's incredibly freeing because I don't have to do all that busy work. <laughs> you know, because uh, if I publish something, which I have done, it's such a pain in the ass. But if I just talk about it, I save nine, 90% of the time you spend on a publication is editing and citation and making sure your uh, sources are primary sources, actually getting those primary sources. Sometimes you got to like buy the book or rent the, you know, check out the book from the library. It has to be mailed. Anyway, so to answer your question, no, and I will never, I will, uh, uh, unless something very strange happens, I will never share my notes and I'll never show my schema therapy questionnaire. And I, I'm sorry. But there are schema therapy questionnaires online that's developed by Young and his colleagues. I, I don't like them as much as I like mine because <laughs> I've tailored mine to my experience of these. But, um, you know, they're available out there. And I know some of you out there are therapists who actually use Young and schema therapy. So, and that's Young like young adults, not Young as in Jung. Anyway, Anonymous Upper Tier Patron says, you have mentioned that when you were really young, you spent lots of time outside because there wasn't anything else to do. But what would you do if the weather didn't allow you to go outside? I'm just curious. Bob, we both grew up in the 70s. Did you spend a lot of time outside as a kid? Yeah. What did you do? Mostly rode my bike, hang out with my friends, play sports. Yeah. Yeah. Like all day long? All day long. And what if weather didn't allow you to go outside what would probably you probably hang out in somebody's house or my house and watch tv and be bored yeah yeah right um or maybe i'd read occasionally i wasn't a big reader when i was a kid god i, I didn't read ever i've always been a bit of a dyslexic reader mm -hmm. and my family doesn't read i think partially because i think my dad has this well my, i think i don't think my dad has said he has dyslexia so no. anyway um yeah Anonymous Cyber Tier Patreon, I find this question to be kind of funny because, not bad, but I think generational. I, f I feel like younger people are like, well, what did you do? Yeah. Uh, because today, of course, we understand, you know, you got video games and the internet and everything that that entails. Sure. And, Can and countless cartoons. Stream. Yeah. I mean, just the cartoon content alone that kids have access to these days. Um, the kids, the kids sh uh, programming <laughs> that, that kids have access to, um, not just recently, but or e even with um, Cartoon Network that started 20 years ago. I remember when that happened, I'm like, my God, I would have killed for cartoons 24 seven because there were just select moments and you're stuck with whatever was being played, you know, like He Man is not a great cartoon, but I watched it oh, when yeah. I was in the sixth or seventh grade right. because that was all that was on. Yeah, uh, everything else was for old people. Four o'clock. Yeah, on school day. Right. So I remember when my friend got a VCR. It was a Betamax, and you could rent a movie. Right. Wow. The yeah. only time I ever saw movies was at the movie theater. Or when they were on TV, of course, or like the assembly, the holiday assembly, like at school or whatever, they might show, they might show a movie. Um, uh, anyways, um, but but yeah, nowadays there's so yeah. much access to so much. Yeah, it's really and and I have come to take it for granted. Like I don't even, you know, like it's hard to. It's not hard to remember back then. It's kind of hard to remember. A time when you didn't have access to yeah. literally everything that you could yeah, ever want to watch. That's true. It's true. Like like YouTube videos about how to do plumbing. You know, like I would never tackle plumbing without YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It's and that's kind amazing. of even. Ra I mean, YouTube. I think. I mean, certainly there were videos about plumbing fifteen years ago, but uh, not like there is today. Yeah. The past few years, it just the the quality. Yeah, and the ability to find that one video is just so it's high. really really cool. Yeah, so I find that younger people will sometimes ask me this question. It's just like I don't understand. Like what? <laughs> you just played outside because the the answer the the way I'll answer the question is we played outside anyway. Even when the weather sucked, 
we still played outside because there wasn't anything to do inside. <laughs> and uh, in, in Seattle, the weather doesn't get that bad. Yeah. So even if it was snowing, that was even more of a reason to be outside. Oh, if yeah, it's raining, sure. I, I remember even just by myself, I had this obsession with uh, making little rivers. Like, because there's, when it rained, there would in my driveway, which was a dirt driveway, there would be these little rivers, oh, yeah, yeah. little stream, tiny little streams, you sure. know, like just an inch or two across. Right. But I would try to make a dam. Oh, yeah. We did that on the street. Okay. We'd get the sweep the gravel from, you know, whoever's driveway or whatever and make a dam. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot more elaborate than what I did. But but along those lines, yeah. I'm just like, well, it's raining. And so I might as well just play with the rain. Yeah. <laughs> And and that would take hours, and I'd really make it a project. Or I would catch ants in the woods and make a little terrarium in a jar. Or I would just climb trees to see how high I could go. Or I'd ride my bikes and we'd go off a jump. Yeah. Or we would play um, a game where we would just tackle each other and hurt each other or something. Yeah. And so to answer your question you know if when the weather wasn't good what did we do um we just we still played outside (laughs) because the inside had nothing for us and if we played inside we sometimes played basically a version of what we would have played outside yeah we would still like tackle it we'd play football inside yeah 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 we played and my parents would say go outside yeah that's why we play football outside right um now I'm not saying there wasn't some TV. I'm not saying there wasn't some video games, you know, especially when Nintendo came out. I mean, Atari, we played a fair amount of, but there's only so much you could do with Atari. Um, I didn't read because that just wasn't my family. Yeah. Um, You know, there was occasional things to do inside, but there was a time, though, when I do remember watching a lot of TV. There was this one summer where I remember... I had my own TV in my room. This Whoa. Must have, yeah. I think I got sick one time. Whoa. And they put the TV... Because whenever you got sick, you got the other TV, which was a 13-inch black and white television. Right on. Which, incidentally, I think became my TV well into my 30s. It was like... Because I couldn't afford a, a real TV. I don't remember ever seeing it. Yeah. Where the house I had on Beacon Hill, we had... Well, eventually, I had a 25-inch Philips which I remember going, whoa. But before that, well, the TV I had in my apartment in Wallingford on that rolly thing, it was a 13-inch little crappy thing. I anyway, don't remember the rolly thing. Yeah. Might have we never a, watched TV. We used to play cards at your house. Right. Yeah. So, and I didn't have cable. It just, anyway, point is, is that I got a TV in my room and I would actually go through the TV guide and circle what I was going to watch. Yeah. You know, uh, Okay, I'm going to watch My Three Sons, right. then I'm going to watch Bewitched, then I'm going to watch The A-Team or whatever it was, you yeah. know. And so I do remember there were times when I played, a when I watched a lot of TV, but most of the time, or I would draw. I liked to draw. I played Dungeons and Dragons a lot inside when I was a kid. Anyway. Um, and... I also remember a fair amount of moments where I would go to my mom and say, I'm bored. Yeah. And my mom, I, I don't know why I would bark up that tree because my, you know, my mom has three other kids. It, uh, you know, my parents kind of had a philosophy of figure it out for yourself, you idiot. And so I don't know why I went to my mom with the, I mean, I think my mom must have helped me at times, but majority of the time I think my mom was like, well, what do you want me to do about it? You know, you're bored figured out and uh so it wasn't like the outside was an endless source of compelling entertainment it i do remember often just being like what do i do particularly when my friends were busy or it was a time of day when it didn't make a lot of sense but the other thing i'll say actually to fill in the picture is whenever i had a chance i was with my friends and at a certain age that pretty much meant all the time and so we were always just together doing we would be watching tv together we'd be walking to school together we'd be spending the night together we'd go to the store together it was always like 
I had a group of core friends that lived right across the street from me, by the way, and which was nice. And so that always kind of broke the boredom, you know, just having someone to, we would listen to music together or, you know, whatever we would do. And so. Scrape together 35 cents and go buy a pack of gum. Right. When I was a kid, that's when the nonstick bubble gum came out. Nonstick. Oh, you know, so like bazooka. Yeah. If you if you blow a bubble and it land and it pops on your face, it easily it can stick. Uh huh. But then bubble yum came out, and then bubble delicious, which had that was strawberry and orange, delicious. Uh, I can't chew gum now because it just makes my jaw tired. But back then, scrape together thirty five cents, have pack gum. Maybe it lasts a day, maybe two. Yeah. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. I didn't know it was non-stick. That's funny. Yeah. I was never good or interested, really, in blowing bubbles. It seemed a bit histrionic to me, honestly. Like, <laughs> it's like, well, why do you need to blow a bubble? You know, I knew people that they would blow bubbles, like, almost every breath. They'd be like, they'd bl- blow a little bubble. A little bubble, yeah. And then yeah. they'd pop and then it. And pop it. And little then bubble, pop choo, it. choo choo pop. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, I remember when Bubblicious came out, and it, because it had a little bit of juice in the middle. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And it would it would burst and give you because that was always the thing growing up was like you wanted your gum to have flavor flavor you didn't want it to just be a a thing of cock that you're like chewing on you know which is what it became right pretty fast anyways and Bubblicious had this burst you know that was the whole marketing it was when they started marketing gum towards kids kids yeah because before that it was like towards adults you right. know. Uh, Dentine or double mint or double what's, mint double or something double what's the double double mint yeah double mint the spearmint stick yeah 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 double your pleasure with double mint gum anyway let's take a break yep hey deserving listeners as y'all know i am constantly recommending that people go to therapy we all need therapy from time to time well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy. And you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today. All right, we're back from the break. Let's do an OPP. These people became patrons all the way back in February of 2020. Wow. Just before the lockdown. Wow. And have stayed patrons ever since. We got Sue and Jade and Kelly and Ayana or Ilana, Iliana, sorry, Iliana from Great Britain. Wow. Katie from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Kelly from Florida. Michelle from God knows where. Miranda from Portland, California. Where's Portland, that? California. Is that like Northern California? No idea. Mm-hmm. Emilia from Seattle. Jason, upper tier patron from Rossmore, California. Tracy from God knows where. And Matt from San Marcos, Texas. Thank wow. you so much for becoming a patron and staying pa- and staying a patron ever since February of 2020. Next email. Anonymous upper tier patron Janie says, My boyfriend and I have been together for six years. He has never told me that he loves me. I told him I needed to hear that he loves me, and he Mm. says he feels it, but he does not like saying it. Hmm. Is this a problem? Am I in a relationship of, of convenience for him? Help. I do feel that he has feelings for me because when he touches me or holds me, I feel it. Maybe I'm experiencing him in rose colored glasses. Maybe not. I don't know. But I understand if he has trouble verbalizing it, how he feels about me, because I am the same. Each time I have tried to tell him that I love him verbally, it's too painful for me to do it. I've told him in writing, though, as Tolstoy once wrote, love, love, the reason I dislike that word is that it means too much for me, far more than you can understand, end quote. 
That quote is the epitome of me and when I'm in love. We aren't very emotional people who enjoy mushy things. But the older I get, the more I want my partner to be to be like that with me. I've never had a guy I love show me love in a grand way. Is it unrealistic to want someone who would buy me flowers on a regular day just because he thought of me? Is it unrealistic to want a guy to be a bit more like the movies? Not all the time, but sometimes? Bob, what do you think? Very few wants are unrealistic. I don't know if you're going to get them, but do you want someone to buy you flowers? You want Sweetie to buy you flowers? That sounds nice. Cool. You want Sweetie to tell you uh, verbally that he loves you? Yeah, right. Totally normal thing to want. Um, And I guess that's not his speed. Though I think you being direct about what you want gives you a bigger shot at getting it. I know that it's vulnerable to reveal to somebody what we want. And sometimes people get stuck in that thing where, well, if I have to ask for it, then it doesn't really count. I I don't really buy that. I think that if I tell myself if I ask for it and it doesn't really count, I bet I haven't really asked for it in a vulnerable way. I haven't let partner know really how meaningful and purposeful or how meaningful the thing is to me. Um, so that's hard to do. I mean, I, I don't know if it's hard to do. It's um, vulnerable to do it. And, you know, we often shy away from that. It also doesn't guarantee that um, you're going to get what you want. He might not really roll that way or, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the asking for it thing, I hate the idea that is out in culture that if you have to ask for it, it invalidates it because in all my experiences per- personally and professionally past a certain, you know, honeymoon period of a relationship, you literally have to ask for everything. And if you don't ask for it, you ain't getting it. <laughs> so um, to just wait in the corner for something to happen is completely irrational and uh, doesn't help. So, you know, if you want someone to pass you the salt at dinner, you don't sit there and go like, well, I hope someone passes me the goddamn salt. You fucking ask for the salt. So ask for it. Now, it's a huge vulnerable thing, and I get that. It'd be nicer if people could read your mind. Sure. But it's not reasonable. No. And uh, you have to ask, hey, I need you to tell me you love me. Hey, I need you to tell me you're attracted to me. Hey, I would love it if you made me feel loved and secure. Hey, I don't feel very safe and secure with you. Can you make me, can you do that for me? Hey, I feel like you don't appreciate me, not because you're a jerk face, but because I just haven't heard it. I need that. I really like that. Can you tell me? You got to say it. And I know that sucks because it is vulnerable and sets you up for rejection, but it just is what it is. You don't walk into a restaurant and just hope that they know what you want. (laughs) You got to ask for it. Yeah. Hey, what do you think of the following? People will say stuff like that, and what they're saying is, in the general case in the future, I want to feel appreciated as opposed to, I would like to feel appreciated right now. What's the question? What do you think about, because you know how it can be where I tell you what I want and it's a test to see if you're actually going to supply it. Like, I'd like you to bring me flowers. And now I'm going to watch and see if you bring me flowers. And if you only do it the once, it's because I asked or whatever. And now I'm sort of watching, well, you never bring them because, you know, you don't think about it or whatever. Well, of course, you would be watching because you want it. Yeah. It's it's the attitude. I don't know if this is what you're asking, but it's, to me, the attitude of I'm going to go on a campaign to get my needs met. Yeah. And they're probably not, you know, even if they do get me flowers, yeah. it's probably just going to be once. Yep. But I'm, gonna, I'm on a mission to create a new habit. And so I'm going to take it easy on them. But I trust that they do want to please me, you know, because... Yeah. The attitude of, well, I'm going to watch them, I'm going to scrutinize them, yeah. assumes that you have to toe the line, and you don't. You yeah. just have to download into them your feelings enough such that their feelings will motivate them to meet your needs. And the fact that it's new information to them, it'll take them a while to figure it out. And uh, it's you know heading into scary territory for them. So to, to answer your question, annual up to your patron, Janie, um, it sounds like the two of you are made for each other <laughs> because you both hate to say I love you. You know, you started the email by saying, you know, he doesn't say he loves me. And then you started saying, 
I also hate saying I love you. Mm. <laughs> so the two of you met and fell in love and are with each other uh, for a number of reasons, that being one of them, which is great. Now you are starting to feel safe enough, I'm guessing, to start to go to those mushy places. Oh, that's cool. And you want to do that. Now, he is uncomfortable with it um, and, and says, so there's a lot of things I'll say. One is is that absolutely what Bob says, just talk about it, you know, and just say, hey, I, I need this, I, I want it. It's not uh, automatic that he's going to be able to do it, but he can, he has the capacity to make you feel loved. So maybe for him, he has trauma around the word, the words I love you. It could be. But as you say, um, that you, you say, I do feel that he has feelings for me because when he touches me, he holds me. So let's say that he couldn't talk for some reason. Would that mean that he doesn't love you? No. So there's a lot of ways of expressing love. Let's say that he did say he loved you, but you didn't feel it. So saying I love you isn't, you know, what I think you're going for, Janie, is I think generally you're wanting to amp up the affection and warmth and expression beyond what the two of you are comfortable with earlier on. The I love, you're focusing on the I love you, but ask yourself this, Janie, if he uh, amped up, let's say he says, look, I'm sorry, I can't say that phrase, but I can express to you more often that I love you. I will hug you more often. I'll have more eye contact. I'll spend more time with you. I'll listen to you. I'll be more vulnerable, but I can't say I love you. That's just, it's just one of the, I just, it's gross to me or I have trauma around it or I get scared or something. Okay. So I would focus on um, what the base, what you're trying to achieve by going down this road. I, the other thing I would question Janie is that since you and your boyfriend are both like this and you're starting to emerge out of it, my guess is, is that you're starting to fight with yourself a little bit. You're starting to look at yourself and say, be less like Tolstoy, <laughs> you cold woman, you, you know, you're probably saying that to yourself on the inside and there's a conflict there and you might be projecting that onto him instead of looking more at yourself. The other thing is, is if you lead the way with vulnerability and verbal, I love you, or just general expressions of love, uh, he will likely eat it up because he wants it too and will, and will reciprocate in whatever way he feels comfortable with. Um, you know, there are people who have uh, issues around it. Um, so there's that. The buy me flowers thing thing, and the big expressions, again, I would, I would look at what am I trying to achieve? You know, am I really, is it really that important to me that he buy me flowers? Or am I just looking to feel more affection, more attention, more intensity of love? Um, because I find that some people will get super focused on flowers and then it becomes this big fight. And then he's just like, fuck, I guess I got to buy her flowers. So, so he buys you flowers and you don't really feel the love, but you kind of feel like you won the argument, which of course isn't what you're looking for. So there's that. The other thing I would fight against is this notion of that's creeping in of, am I in a relationship of convenience? I mean, what do you think that phrase means, Bob? That, um, it's the path of least resistance at the present moment. Right. Yeah. And he doesn't really love her. He's not really, yeah. And It doesn't sound like that's the case, but. Right. It does not sound like that's the case. <laughs> you know, it sounds like he loves you and. Just not demonstrative. Yeah. It's just, it, 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 neither one of you are. Yeah. So uh, you're, you want to change that. And that, I think that's, it's totally fine. And I, I, I would interpret that as you, both of you feel safe enough to start to open up a little bit which wouldn't be unusual. Uh, anonymous patron says, is seeing the same therapist as your friend who was okay with it problematic? I've recently started seeing a therapist who was recommended to me by, by a friend. I thought nothing of it at first since I don't talk about them in therapy, but now I'm wondering if this is potentially problematic. I'm worried that telling my therapist I'm friends with another client of hers might put her in an awkward position or create a conflict of interest unnecessarily, but not telling her feels kind of dishonest. Besides, what if my friend brings it up during one of their sessions and that's how she finds out? Would she feel betrayed? Could it cause other problems? 
I like the therap I like this therapist a lot, even though I haven't been seeing her that long. So having to switch to something else like this would be a bummer. I'd really appreciate your take on the situation. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, um, I I tend not to do this. If somebody says, I've got a friend that I'd really like you to see, I tend to say, I want to just be the therapist you need me to be and keep things simple. And if I was the last therapist in town, okay, fine, maybe we'd have a different conversation. But since there are a lot of other good people out there, you just soon just keep it simple and I can give you some ideas of who might who might be a good fit or whatever. Um, have you ever seen two friends? Yes. Yeah. Was it a problem? I don't know. Okay. I, it's hard to know. Like you can't you can't know for certain. Like, right. does one of them feel uncomfortable talking to me because of you know um, they know I have a relationship with the other? It's, right. You can't really know. Might they have not complained about their friend right. because they knew that you were right. seeing them? Yeah. Like the person who wrote in here doesn't even know if the therapist already heard about. Right. Because the therapist won't divulge that and can't. Right. Um, you know, I, I, it doesn't necessarily, it's it's the reasonable thing to talk about because clearly you're having lots of angst about it. So, yeah, why don't you bring it up with your therapist and talk about whether or not there is going to be, a, there could be a conflict and whether or not it would interfere with them being the therapist that you need and deserve. And if it is, then they could be awesome and they're not your therapist. And if it isn't, then okay, great. Or if it isn't right now and you want to keep going. What do you know. mean they're not your therapist? I mean that if they're not the therapist you need them to be. The way they react to it? Let's say that um, the friend, let's say that they, the two friends need to talk about their relationship with one another with this therapist. In other words, oh, I'm having a hard time with my friend. And I'm the therapist, and I'm hearing about that. And then the other friend is like, I'm having a hard time with my friend, and now I'm wearing two hats, right? If they needed to use their work with me to talk about the friendship, then, you know, that might make it difficult for me to be the therapist that they need and deserve. Because it's just a lot of hats to wear. So, um, so no therapist is that good that you know you can't find somebody else who's you know going to be able to help you or whatever and um so if 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 you think that there's a potential for that that you know could be like i need to talk about this friendship with so and so is this going to be a problem get the cards on the table yeah but, yeah yeah uh what i'll say is that uh, if I were in your position and not a space student, yeah, I would just tell my therapist, as Bob said, it's creating some monks, so just say something. It's like, you know, hey, I, I feel weird bringing this up, and I don't know if it matters, but I'm actually friends with another one of your clients, and I, you don't have to tell me anything about it, but I just felt weird that I didn't tell you about that because I was actually, my, my friend so-and-so recommended you to me. Right. And I didn't think it would be a big deal because they're not really a huge part of my, I don't, they're not part of my issues yeah. and I'm guessing I'm not part of their issues. And it didn't occur to me to mention that when I first uh, started with you, but now that we've gotten more involved, it started to kind of eat away at me. Like I was keeping a secret from yeah. you or something. And so I just wanted to tell you that. Um, yeah, I think that would be fine. Uh, and you're saying, you know, what if my friends brings it up? Not to get all Bob on you right now, but it sounds like this is an important thing to talk about in therapy. It's like, um, so after you say that, and then you say, and by the way, I've been kind of worried about this for a while, and I'm wondering, like, what this has to do with me. Like, w do I have some kind of issue with keeping secrets or shame or rejection? Can we talk about that? Because the fact that you're worried that your friend is going to bring it up and then your therapist is going to reject you and feel betrayed I think speaks way more about you than it does about the situation. Yeah, And what an opportunity right. to talk about and heal and get some awareness around. This is the kind of thing that does happen in small towns. Yeah. And in big towns, you know, I, I it's happened with me before um, because it's really common to be referred to by a friend. Yeah. In fact, I, I won't go into specifics, but um, what do I say? Well, one of the very, very first clients I ever had was some this wasn't a friend of a client but it was a friend of a friend of mine who came to me you know a friend of mine in 
actually our friend group recommended me to someone and they came into a session. I actually saw this client in your office on Capitol Hill. Oh, wow. Remember that trees, the tree chair? Yeah. So oh. Bob had this furniture that was made up. It was not mine. Oh, it was who you were. Uh, yeah, the guy who you were we, subletting. we were subletting from left the country for a year to do a thing with his partner. And Okay. Oh my God. Okay, so all you know, a lot of furniture is made out of wood. This sure. furniture was made out of branches yes. that were not that still had the bark on it. And still had leaves. Still had leaves. And it was like someone just went up to a tree and cut off a branch yeah. and then just sort of manufactured these. It was exactly that. And the tops of them, they were really tall chair. There was a yeah. two seater and a one seater. And they were really tall, yeah. and uh, there were leaves at the top. It was like sitting at the bottom of a tree, except you move and the tree moves, and it rustled yeah. like it was wind in the, you know, whatever. And we both found that absurd. Yeah. I used that office one time, yeah. and it was this one client 25 years ago who was a friend of a friend. Right. And she didn't tell me until the end of the session, because I didn't ask stupidly, that she was a friend of a friend, and I told her, oh, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Yeah. And I learned from that point forward that I have to ask. We can't know. Uh, and so now I always ask, who referred you to yeah, me? Did you find me? Yeah. And I, I actually asked that before they even come into my office, because how is a client supposed to know they're supposed to tell us that information? They, they wouldn't know. You know, if someone referred it, a, a physician, you wouldn't think I have to disclose that or that that's relevant, you know. Um, now, I will say that if, for whatever reason, I had gotten into it with a client for a long time, I would have done my best to preserve that client-therapist relationship and either recused myself from that group uh, to protect. Because, oh, sure. you know, I, I don't want to terminate with someone because I neglected to ask a question in the beginning. Oh, you yeah, know right. I mean? That's messy. Yeah. Um, so... Will your therapist feel betrayed? Not likely. No, I don't think. I mean, betray your your ther There's a chance your your therapist might be like, "Oh shit, I'm actually in a bind right now." You know, they might be a little frustrated, but betrayed is a strong. No, word. you haven't done anything yeah. deceitful. Right, right. So, but in all likelihood, I would give it a ninety five percent chance that your therapist will be like, um, "Oh." No biggie. Yeah. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> right. Uh, patron Leah, Leah from North Carolina says, I'm from Seattle, but I'm currently located in North Carolina. I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor and a PhD student. I specialize in complex and severe trauma and personality disorders. Mm -hmm. Work is obviously exhausting, but worth it. That being said, I think it's time for me to find a therapist of my own to avoid countertransference and even secondary trauma. I had a therapist for a while, but after being in a severe car accident and having to reschedule sessions to fit around medical appointments, my therapist texted me late at night saying, quote, I am uh, obviously not, you are obviously not dedicated to therapy and that sessions should be discontinued. Needless to say, so I don't know if you caught that, but. I, I got it, yeah. Okay. Leah's saying she got an accident. Yeah, she right. had to fit her therapy mm, sessions and their man. therapist said, you're, you're not dedicated to therapy, so. Man. Uh, needless to say, I have not seen them again. I truly had a good feeling about my previous clinician, but now I feel hesitant and do not want to restart multiple times. When, when you and Bob select a therapist, what criteria do you use to rule out or confirm who is a good fit? Bob, what do you think? Oh, I ask questions and then I, I pay attention to how I feel. And if I feel good, then I'm good. You pursue it. Yeah. And, and most of the therapists I find are re referrals from other therapists that, like, my last two therapists were referral because we were in couple therapy and both couple therapists said, hey, Bob, you should go talk to somebody. But the average person doesn't have access to that kind of connection. No. So they're just picking people out of the phone book, essentially. Okay. So what I usually tell people to do is figure out what it is that you want to address in therapy and bring it up in an initial consultation, a phone call or whatever it is that you do and ask what's on your mind and tell them a little bit about what you want and then see how it feels. How do they respond? And not just what do they say, but how do you feel? Do they seem like someone you would want to talk to? Um, that's 
probably what I would do if I were looking for. And then I'm if I needed if I thought I needed them to have particular expertise, I'd ask them what their expertise would say this one thing is, how much of their practice is devoted to it, how much training do they have with it, are they in supervision? I might ask those things, but I'm not really I I wouldn't ask those things cuz I I well, I don't know. Maybe I would. I don't know. Um, it's reasonable to ask about the training experience of the person that you're going to get, you know, start seeing. So, Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd recommend that lay individuals ask those kinds of questions because how would they differentiate? I mean, this Leah or Leah is familiar with training programs, so maybe she would know. But because you could have a good therapist come out of a, a – program that isn't very highly regarded and you can have a terrible therapist that comes out of a highly yes. regarded program. So I'm mostly doing it not because of the information that they say, but how do they field it? Do they get defensive? Yeah. Are they open? Or not so much what they say, because you're right. It's not going to have meaning to most people. Yeah. That first question I think is the, is the best one is like, here's my issue. Right. Um, as you're saying, Leah slash Leah, I, I'm a therapist and I'm having some counter-transference and I'm having some secondary trauma. I'd like to know, what your approach would be. Yeah. And if you're a good enough therapist, you're going to have a good response to that. And there's going to be different layers. You'll have yeah. a short response and a medium response and a longer response. Right. And, and so now I will tell you to the therapists out there, it's okay to say, huh, that's a great question. I don't have time to answer. Could we, could I email you a response? You know, you can, you don't have to answer right then. You're not like in a, you know, having a test or something. Or you could say, oh, you know, my brain's kind of discombobulated right now or whatever. You just say like, C could I please just answer that question later? Or um, so don't feel like you have to answer it right away. But anyway, point is, is that that's what I would do. And, and you would gauge their response to it, their thoughtfulness around it. Um, so, yeah. And then you choose the one that feels best and then you try them out to, for three to five sessions and then, Reevaluate. I think after five sessions, you'll know, is this a good fit or not? Yeah. The other thing I'll say is that I believe you, Leah slash Leah, that your uh, experience with your therapist, you know, you're in a car accident, you're having a hard time with your appointments. I'm guessing maybe you had to late cancel some or maybe there was, you know, some hardship around scheduling that maybe you didn't see your therapist for a few weeks. And you know, some therapists, either because they don't know what you're going through and, and they misinterpret, or they just are jerk faces and just don't take into consideration the whole, the whole, because the, and Bob, I'm sure you can relate to this uh, as I can, is that particularly when I was starting out as there, particularly when I depended on the income of being a therapist, like literally my entire existence revolved around clients paying me private pay fees yeah. that when a client would cancel, it would kind of ruin me. You know, it'd, it'd mean like, well, crap, am I going to be able to pay rent this, this month? And there was another client who was asking for that spot and I'm holding this spot open and they keep canceling on me. Like, what am I doing here? It, it not only financially, but it also emotionally kind of hurts because you, you're always as a therapist trying to come across like you're useful and important enough to, to dedicate your, to, to, and to have clients cancel on you, it always feels pretty shitty. Um, I mean, not always, but it often does. There can also be a, a relief of like, oh, I have an hour where I can run an errand or something. So anyway, point is, is that I, I get the feeling, but to, and I don't know the circumstances, but to just like take it as, you know, because there's this notion out there of just like, well, if a client cancels a bunch of times, that it means the client isn't dedicated to therapy. Ridiculous. And certainly that can happen. But what you're describing, that's not the case. So to have that happen to you is a pretty big problem. And I would understand how you would be hesitant to engage with another therapist. Sure. So I would add that to the thing. I would say countertransference, secondary trauma. Also, if I get in a car accident... <laughs> Or something happens to me and I'm unable to make my appointments and I tell you about that, are you gonna fire me like my last therapist did? If someone told me that, I would I would have a very good response to that because I'm 
I'm adamant about not terminating unless it's absolutely in, like critical. <laughs> like for me to terminate with a client, it's there's a high bar for that kind of thing. And I've always been that way. And I'm toward one end of the spectrum. So I would have a pretty easy response to that. So, you know, you could you could gauge how they respond. Hopefully they would say something like, well, if you have a legitimate reason, then I wouldn't terminate with you because I would understand. <laughs> um, and I would hope that you would communicate with me as soon as possible so that I can, you know, manage my schedule, you know, something like that. Anyway, That's the problem I have with what was described here is that the therapist was making a presumption about the mood of, of right. Leah slash Leia. I think that that's just one of those sloppy things that people do is we, we, when we're uncomfortable with our own situation, we judge somebody else. So rather than say, hey, it's my policy to keep my schedule full or I really need to, we just make the other guy the bad guy and say, well, you're obviously not dedicated. This came up for me recently with... Um, someone that I've been working with for a while and they are um they they have their life is you know got a bunch of stuff in it and so they can't make the time that we agreed to and so I just said you know I'm happy to work with you still and I can't hold this spot for you it's cuz you know my policy is to keep things full and um whatever and and so if you want to keep at it absolutely and um I can't um, we'll have to do it sort of ad hoc then, you know, kind of like we'll do the best we can, right? But so, you know, like that's on, that's that's me managing my own limit, my own need, and not not making that the responsibility of somebody else. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. You know, because we're, we're communi- we, me and my client are communicating clearly with one another about whether or not we have enough overlap here, like a sort of a Venn diagram kind of thing. And um, that's cool. That's that's like we should do that. Right. Yeah. There's a reasonableness to what you're talking about, which is like, let's talk about it. Let's work it out. Like, yeah. I'm not just going to sit back and allow my schedule to be screwed with. Right. But I'm also not going to terminate with you. No. <laughs> but so we'll have a conversation and we'll figure it out. You right. know, and it might mean that you lose dibs on a certain slot, yeah. but it doesn't mean I terminate with no. you. And what I'll say is that this does not surprise me. I, I've I know therapists that operate like this. Yeah, it's just like as soon as there any yeah. there's any kind of issue like this, it's like well, obviously you're not dedicated therapy. Yeah. I terminate with you. And it's just training. like Jiminy crickets. Yeah. Like, and what I always say, and I've had uh, trainees who will sometimes exhibit this either because of their supervision or something. And what I say is, you realize that people come to therapy because they got problems, right? <laughs> Like, and one of those problems might actually make it hard for them to make it to therapy, not only because of uh, social justice reasons or poverty reasons or stress reasons, but also they might have tremendous anxiety about approval from you and, uh, or they might be transferring someone onto you. You understand that there's a thing called transference, right? Like you understand that people have problems and sometimes that makes it so it's hard for them to show up to therapy. So why did you get into this business, you know? One should strive to have a phenomen- phenomenologically empathic attitude towards clients. So yeah. when in doubt, benefit of the doubt, try to think of an empathic reason that a person isn't coming as opposed to a pathologic reason. Right. Yeah. And it just, it just, it never ceases to amaze me how many therapists don't acknowledge or understand that clients have issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. I did, yeah. I, did, I remember a consult years ago when that came up, and I, I said to the therapist, you realize they're coming here for a reason, right? Like, this has something to do with it. Yeah. And she just looked at me like I was from Mars. Yeah, yeah, people are like, huh? But but their problem but the is hard incon- to work with. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, okay, fine. Right. Like, that's, that's why, they're, why here. they're there. Like, I would understand if the buck didn't stop with us, but the do- it does. Because if we don't help that person with this problem, they don't have anywhere else to go. Yeah. There's no different field that they can go, to, right. different discipline they can go to, to address that. That You're the one, <laughs> you're the last stop yeah. on this you know, journey for them. And so yeah. help them, Under- that's your job. You yeah. got, what did you think you were gonna do when you became a therapist? Did you think that all your clients would just be like, super easy and 
a hundred percent enjoying everything that you do all the time. <laughs> and it would just be like you giving advice and going home and cashing the checks. Like be, I hope you understood or someone told you that being a therapist is hard mm. and that clients sometimes they don't like you it's and hard. their issues will sometimes yeah. be transferred onto you and they will target you and that will happen. And there are boundaries, sure. but if it's a little inconvenient that their personality disorder is causing problems in therapy, yeah. wake the fuck up. You're in a field of psychology. That's the whole thing, you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah, obviously it's a sore thing. Because I just think about all the clients out there. Because it's one thing for a client to have this happen. Because this person is a therapist. Yeah. And, and, and imagine if you're not a therapist and you don't know. You're like, well, I guess therapy isn't going to help me. You know, someone terminates with you because you have problems of a therapeutic nature. And someone terminates with you. You're like, well... I guess I don't, there's nowhere else to go or there's something wrong with me. I caused it. I was too annoying or something. Yeah. And that's, you're just part of the problem. Yeah. You're not only, you're not just neutral as a therapist, you're actually piling on in a tremendous way because you're basically eliminating the one option that this person has that actually will help. You're representing the field and showing them nope this is not the place for you you're on your own kid and they will suffer till the day they die they gave they were one of the few individuals who actually gave it a shot and you fucked it up for that individual good job i'm so glad that you entered this field what a wonderful service who what a what a wonderful human being very compassionate about human psychology like what are you doing like if you didn't want to do this and you wanted to become a car salesman or work at Microsoft do that that's fine but don't become a therapist it just drives me bonkers yeah. I mean oh the harm and the the damage that it does to these people I just we we, we should also encourage uh, the person writing in to hang in there they're worth pursuing good treatment and they're entering it for a darn good reason and um just because right now we don't like therapists who do this doesn't mean that therapists out there are bad yeah i hope she hangs in with it the other option is to find a supervisor yeah um also reasonable because what you're looking for is largely clinical yeah. and Specific. a good mentoring uh, supervisor can it can absolutely feel like therapy. Yes. It's not therapy, but but yeah, yeah. People who have come to me for supervision and they want to talk about secondary trauma or countertransference, like we'll get into it. Yeah, and we'll have some. In some ways, well, anyway, it's a very deep conversation yeah. about their childhood, about what's going on there, about sure. how they're feeling as a therapist, and it can get intense. So, yeah. all right, well, that is it for that episode. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>